Are face reveals still a thing? Are they still a thing? No? Alright. Vlogging. What a choice. I'm Newbie Spud, the author of Friendship is Dragons, a screen cap webcomic reimagining the show as though it were simply a D&D campaign, much like DM of the Rings or Darth's and Droids. This is harder than I expected it to be, and it's reached 1,000 pages, which I can hardly believe. Not that I ever really had any reason to doubt that I might, I just had never really thought about it. The idea that I could be doing something like this, a project like this, for so long that that it reaches a thousand pages? Six and a half years? Almost? Almost six and a half, yeah. Started in July, late July of 2011. Now, why is this not like the last three milestone videos? Why is it not a semi-animated, well, more like transitioned comic with illustrations of stories from the comments? And the reason for that is because my workflow for those videos sucks, and I just don't have the energy and time. I mean, we're talking about looking through 250 web pages worth of comment sections, looking for stories that are at the right length, not too long, not too short, and can be illustrated by screen caps from the show. And I, I'm really slow at it. I mean, to do story time three which was already late. Uh, just the raw work on that, on top of everything else I was doing, took like two weeks for... And how long was the video? Six and a half minutes? And besides, this is in celebration of reaching four digits, for which for a webcomic, especially a webcomic you just sort of started because you thought it was a cute idea, that's huge. I wanted to do something a bit more special and personal. So this is my story. How did this begin? Well, I mean, you could probably trace, like, certain influences back through middle school, really, when I discovered Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. I mean, technically, you can trace it back there. And then, what really got me wanting, at least in the back of my mind, to do a webcomic was my dad actually started his own webcomic uh, called Quacked Pains. I've got a link to it up on the French of His Dragons site. So I thought it was cool, and I wanted to do one of my own, but I just, I didn't want to just, like, crap one out. I wanted to wait until, you know, the right idea came along. So then, obviously, there's my inspirations, DM of the Rings and Darths and Droids. But, I mean, I read them for a while, and it wasn't, like, immediately after that uh, I wanted to do that, because they predate My Little Pony by a fair bit. What happened next? So 2010, then, is when I played in my first D&D campaign in 4th edition. Kind of a homebrew setting run by my friend Dan, who later made the Ponytails homebrew RPG system, and now I think works at Blizzard on Hearthstone. And, you know, obviously enjoyed the crap out of that. Uh, so we basically ran a campaign all summer. Then I went off to college... Then I came back and we played a bit more d and I'm not sure if it was that summer or the summer before that I ran my first campaign as a DM, which was in the Eberron setting, I think. So I had my first big D&D experience. I loved it. But I was going off to college where I knew I was going to be so busy I wasn't really going to be able to play. But that May, I think it was May of 2011, like right as the first season ended and the first uh, summer hiatus began, I binge-watched the show and discovered that it was really good. And, you know, I came back from home, came back from college that summer a brony. Uh, back when, you know, the popularity of the show was at, you know, just really breaking out into the broader culture. But, you know, I went back home and I played more D&D &D with my friends. But, you know, as it became clear that I was going to go back for another year of college, I you know, started to crave more of a fix, and more of that D&D &D fix. Then there was Erin Pallett's series of blog posts on uh, her blog Lurking Rhythmically that sort of laid out how it maps to a D&D &D campaign, and also that's 
how I got Rarity as a social rogue. And I was like, that's perfect. That's spot on. That was really the catalyst that made me go, okay, we're doing this. This is a solid concept. We're just, I'm just going to start writing. That's how it began. That's how Friendship as Dragons got started. It's just, I'd wanted to make a webcomic for a long time, and I was wanting something that I could channel Dungeons and Dragons into, and also do something about all the creative energy coming from My Little Pony, and all I could really do was write. You know, then I looked into, uh, you know, a program that could help me with the arrangement of the art, because I'm not an artist. I didn't want to just try and manually Photoshop every element. I didn't have the time. Or Photoshop. And I uh, discovered Comic Life. It's not a especially robust program, but it had what I needed, which was placing panels, putting images into panels, adjusting panels, and then putting in and adjusting word balloons, which, if I had to do that by hand, this, you know... The workflow would have been insane, and I would not have gotten here. So thank you, Comic Life. Thank you, whoever publishes that software. So that's how it began. That's how Friendship with Dragon started. At first, I uh, published for two days a week. I think it was Tuesday and Thursday. You know, I got used to it enough within about ten pages of that, so about five weeks. I'm shaking this thing. Crap. Stay still. Stay. And then I figured, okay. I can probably do three on top of everything else. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And for some reason, I decided to also, as a celebration of that big move, I decided to say, okay, every ten, I'm going to make one that's extra long, because I can. And that's absolutely not going to cause any stress later when I'm on a deadline. Smart move, spud of the past. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's every detail of how it began. Just as an aside, as sort of another story of something that's been going on, when I, you know, started to actually start promoting the site, by which I mean throwing down a couple links here and there, because I am so bad at self-promotion, it's it's not even funny, it's sad, really. I don't think I started the Friendship is Dragons TV Tropes page, but I did uh, help edit the fledgling campaign comics page of TV Tropes. You know, campaign comics being, you know, Demon of the Rings, Darth and, Dro- Darth and Droids, mine, uh, One Piece, Grand Line 3.5, all of them that have that same basic premise. It's a D&D campaign, not a show. But here's why I bring that up. Here's why this is a story I'm telling. Uh, back when I first edited that page, there were about, like, 12 links in the list of all the examples of campaign comics, including mine, including Darth's, including DM. It was a small, fledgling genre when I jumped into it. You know, there was Doom of the Rings, which stood alone, not entirely alone. You know, some people tried to copy it and went a small distance and then burned out and stopped. And then Darth's and Droids came along and actually, you know, took at the distance with Star Wars, which, you know, was a strong move. So you had Lord of the Rings and Star Wars that had been adapted like this. Uh, but still not a lot of people really doing something big with it. Then I jumped in, and pretty much at the same time, uh, One Piece Grand Line 3.5 jumped in. And based on how the genre has grown since then, I feel like Friendship is Dragons and One Piece Grand Line 3.5 comprise the third wave of the campaign comic uh, timeline, I guess. Team of the Rings, it spawned, like, you know, a handful of imitators here and there that weren't really notable. You had Darth's and Droids, which uh, spurred a slightly bigger effort. And then me and Dragon Trainer came along, and now that list on TV Tropes has tripled. I mean, just tripled. Tripled. My hands aren't usually in the shot. (sighs) You go to war with the army you have. And it's weird to me. Now, why is it weird to me? Why does that seem odd to me? Because I have inspired others to be further imitators. Okay, here's why. 
it feels weird when you're making a fan product to then inspire further pieces of fan product, whether it's recursive fanfic or, you know, new entries in your subgenre. Usually you make one, it is simply a part of that ecosystem, and there we go. But perhaps it's also my lack of self-esteem. Wait, I, I inspired someone to make something? My crap inspired someone to make something in the same vein? Okay, sure. But seriously, what show hasn't someone tried to make a comic out of? I didn't really think consciously about this at the start. But over time, I've noticed that I had some rules that I kind of stuck to going into this, which I think you just sort of naturally do when you start working on a new creative project. You know, you have to make certain calls on, you know, perspective and style and genre and tone, you know, to the best of your ability without having actually written it yet. Here's some of the rules I, I kind of realized I chose without actually, you know, writing it down in advance. One was always use pure, unedited screenshots. Every screen cap I've taken from the show uh, is unedited and not even, like, flipped around. Except, like, I think I flipped around one screen cap. I think for, like, a sub-panel. For the most part, every screen cap used as intended. I think I did that for two reasons. One, it's a creative limitation. I have to work with what I got and not try and get too fancy. And two... I wanted people to be able to look at the screen caps on the page and be able to say, oh, I know what episode that's from. And then they'd go back and rewatch it and go, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I gained from that, but that's kind of why I did it. I wanted, be <laughs> I wanted to draw attention to the fact that these were screen caps by being, you know, super faithful. I don't know, so it would be more impressive that I pulled a different story out of them? Maybe. Maybe that's kind of the whole point. Anyway, the other rule I gave myself starting out was always try to end on a joke or a punchline or at least something snarky. That's a bit more of an explicit rule I gave myself. At the time, I was concerned about the trend of webcomics that start out funny, goofy for laughs and then trend towards the other end of that spectrum, just pure drama all the time. I don't think I've avoided that because I've built up a lot of plot continuity and I've built up a lot of payoffs that depend on actual emotional stakes. Whoops. But I still think that decision was important to make because at the end of the day, D&D &D is for fun and laughs and community and, you know, absurdity to a certain extent. I mean, your stories have certainly demonstrated that better than my made-up comic events ever could. I mean, I've heard some crazy stuff from you guys. I feel, you know, if I let myself slide further into drama than I already have, then I'd probably be missing the point, I feel like. Actually, there's a third rule, which I forgot until now. Uh, the characters don't have names. Why did I decide the characters didn't have names? I knew I decided they were girls. DM's genderless, doesn't have a name. The players don't have names. They refer to themselves either indirectly or by their characters. Or by their classes. I think the answer boils down to I didn't like it in Darth's and Droids. Or I didn't like it really in any other comic. I didn't like having to track n times two names for all the characters. And I wasn't planning on differentiating them much anyway. Twilight Sparkle's player acts like Twilight Sparkle. Applejack's player acts like Applejack. Say that five times fast. There was no distinction in my mind in terms of character and behavior. Rarity is the role player. Rainbow Dash wants to hit everything. It was so close that it didn't matter. So this is just going to be a lightning round where I go through the main story arcs and to say something off the top of my head, just sort of my most prevalent thought about each of them. Uh, Friendship is Magic Part 1. <sighs> I think if you look back there, you can really tell that I was really trying to get a handle on uh, paneling. And I'm a little sad now that <laughs> my paneling style has gotten really kind of homogenized, standardized. 
and I wish I was doing some crazier stuff with it. Friendship is Magic Part 2. I mean, what can I say other than page 90, right? Um, I, I don't think, I don't think I've topped that page. I don't think I've topped page 90 in the entire rest of the run. Though I've tried. I've, <laughs> there are some other pages I really like too, but, uh, but that one, that one just, <laughs> that one really cemented the comic as a thing, I think. If I had not stuck that landing, uh, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I'd be doing this right now. Dragon Shy. Dragon Shy. My favorite thing about Dragon Shy is just having the dragon talk and his whole personality. That added a whole lot to it. Dragon Shy was also just a lot of fun because it was the closest to a D&D campaign that there was in the show. Bridal Gossip. Bridal Gossip was a challenging one. And not just because of the poetry. You know, I kind of stretched the limit of... If that were an actual D&D game, the players might have rioted a little bit. Kind of didn't calibrate it right, I don't think. I think the, the criticisms I had in that uh, arc were pretty valid. Swarm of the Century slash A Dog and Pony Show. That's, that's kind of the first time uh, I went off the rails, isn't it? Uh, Friendship is Magic... Dragon Shy, Bridal Gossip, those were all played, basically. This is the episode going all the way through. Uh, Some of the Century is the first time I just straight up cancelled an episode and worked in a completely different one into the plot. It's kind of interesting to look back at that now, because that's kind of become the norm now. And of course, of course, there was uh, page 300, I think, the subversion page, the I Thought You Wanted ranting uh, flip around. I was really happy with that. <laughs> Feeling Pinky Keen. Feeling Pinky Keen. That one was another one of those episodes that, like, I have to do this. I have to tackle this somehow. And I think I mentioned this in an author's note. Basically, I was writing that one sort of as I went, and I did not really know what my answer was going to be. I didn't end up... Uh, Dealing with the intellectual issue of faith, I just sort of came up with a more humanist answer. I think I managed to limbo under the bar, which was not easy. Sweet and elite. Sweet and elite. A lot of the stuff with Fancy Pants was blatantly stolen from a fanfic that I really liked. I forget. A Diary of an Evil Pony, I think it was. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I basically just stole that because I really liked it. And I felt like it would be the basis of a good twist involving Fancy Pants not being part of the Thieves' Guild. Yeah, I think that's about it. Luna Eclipsed. Luna Eclipsed was a lot of fun. It's also another feeling pinky keen situation where I did not know what my answer was going to be to sort of the twist. The answer I figured out in what seems to have been sort of, again, later become sort of my standard operating procedure, is... Do it intentionally and with, you know, some consideration to the consequences. Um, then I did the whole, the fun has been halved joke, didn't I? God, that was so long ago. You know, doing a campaign comic is not just putting the screen caps in, putting word balloons in, and then, you know, having a DM yell at everybody. You know, you also have to deliver on concepts from the show and, you know, just sort of do a spin on the greatest hits, which is kind of a tall order. Fall Weather Friends. I'm pretty happy with how I worked in uh, a hearthwarming tale. I liked that sequence a lot. A lot of setup going on in that arc. Mostly just letting the, the competition play out in dice, which, you know, in retrospect is kind of boring. Although the, the meta, meta, meta game comic... You know, with Rainbow Dash spinning slash not spinning the sign and tricking Applejack. That was sort of the Dark Horse best page of that comic, or that arc. Yeah, I was really happy with that one. I'm, I'm just really, I really like meta narrative, meta actions, characters who are self-aware. That's, that's my jam. The last roundup. Another kind of frustrating session to actually play in. And the way I sort of set it up is because I figured that if Applejack were actually there, 
she would have told them straight up. You know, she she wouldn't have made a big deal out of it. But with her gone and that, you know, situation sort of being in secret, I figured the DM wouldn't know if that was okay. And because of the contrived reason that they couldn't just contact her, Hurricane Fluttershy. All I can remember off the top of my head is the whistle. Oh, right, the breezies. I decided to bring in the breezies. That was the big sort of midway twist. And uh, for me, that's when the whole Rainbow Dash not getting her ticket became sort of a running gag for me. Kind of an annoying gag in the end, but uh, that's, when, that's when it sort of became official to me. Pinky Pride. Gilda was a lot of fun. Just in general. Just tons of fun. And I feel like that was a good time to show that Rainbow Dash had matured a lot. You know, show her the length of her journey. And then, of course, you know, when at the end of the second sonnet, oh my god, I can't believe I've done two sonnets for this, when she sandwiches like, why, thank you. Wait a minute. <laughs> the screen cap is of, you know, Gilda being covered in cake and whatnot, and then just roaring out and cake goes flying but because of the arrangement of screen caps as a commenter pointed out it looks like gilda burst out of cheese sandwich like a xenomorph which was kind of the intent of those screen caps but i was still really happy to see that interpretation because i i kind of thought of that but i didn't know if anyone else is going to see that and i'm really glad like super glad that uh that was that was apparent you know it's it's not immediately obvious to see that mental image because I couldn't quite connect the two that way, but I'm glad the connection was made. Sonic Rain Boom. Sonic Rain Boom. That one was, in terms of episodes, that I had to do and I had to get it right, as right as I could. That one reigned supreme. I'm also pretty fond of one of the particular pages where I basically string a plot through like five episodes in season five i think and tie them all together and it's sort of a self-parody of how i just <laughs> just have all these jumps and and tie in all these plots that was that was sort of my self-parody moment i wasn't actually going to play that one out but uh it was just sort of poking fun at myself for just making up a story out of all these disparate parts and then you know where we're at right now is the best night ever and what i'm super super happy about is chris ds's uh you know vector artwork paper doll work as he calls it to make custom fake screen caps so i could have a proper boss fight to pay off the thieves guild arc you know which i have decided is sort of the heroic tier arc of the equestria campaign in this setting and i figured it wasn't going to be satisfying without that kind of boss fight That's, that's six and a half years of stories. Of fanfic, really. I've, I've dragged you guys through a lot. I'm glad you guys are still with me through all of, all of that. But of course, I didn't do it alone. I counted. And there are 115 guest comics. So more than 10% of this milestone belongs to contributors. And I basically wanted to have guest comics for a pretty selfish reason, and that's because I wanted to be able to take breaks from the comic without interrupting my update schedule. And I also wanted to see other people's takes on the concept. And I'm really happy that I did that, because some of the artists have been able to do things that I would never have been able to do with this. Like, well, for one thing, use actual art. But uh, alternate takes, you know, including the CMC, which the main story just doesn't really have enough room to include but yeah also it you know gave me some much needed breaks from the comic and i'm super grateful to every single one of those people who contributed whether they were other webcomic artists or you know other people in the my little pony community or just random readers from the show this comic really it's my baby but it's also it's a baby you helped me raise, basically. Uh, 
and then there's Fallout is Dragons, which is the podcast. Because I always, I always wanted to do a podcast. That's how I. It's basically how I start anything. Is I want, I basically work off a bucket list. I want to make something in this medium at least once. I want to try it out. And you know, I listened to. I think it was the it was Retsu Talk or something. They had a like a just a random tabletop campaign episode, and I was like. That's an that's a fantastic idea, and sent out the call. And I was also dying to just run a game of my own or just play a game of my own. And also, I'd gotten back into Fallout Equestria again, rereading that. So I was I was charging up creative energy from that. So yeah, that's how that that's how that went down. It got a little bumpy towards the end, but getting seven people to stick around and not fight. For two and a half years is hell of a is a hell of a challenge, but I'm really happy with uh, really happy with that whole project overall. I'm glad that it finished. I like finishing things. I li- I feel like the ending is the most important part of any story. There's a temptation to just let things continue forever, you know, to serialize everything forever, but. I feel like things are more precious and more satisfying when they do end and you know not always end happily but for the most part that's that's kind of why we we engage in stories not just for escapism but because the biggest emotional hit of that story comes at the end so and as a creator all that to say as a creator it's good to finish things that you start and see how that affects people. And I feel like uh, I feel like we created something that a lot of people engaged with. And I what the hell I'll announce it right now. I'm considering not starting because I can't really handle more than 1.5 campaigns at a time. But considering doing kind of a sequel to that campaign where it's like a second playthrough in a Fallout game where you roll up a new set of characters tackling the same setting, maybe with some DLC added. So like a FID 2.0 or FID playthrough 2, like same setting, different player characters, maybe some extra content packs, but like how would a new set of characters tackle the same setting and the same problems, the same characters, because I feel like the Dragon Maulers, you know, their their interactions with those characters sort of defined how that campaign's events played out, and I feel like a new set of characters would possibly, you know, change that order of events quite a bit. And also, it would be fun to play through a homebrew campaign where I already know a lot of the characters and where all the people are. (laughs) Which, uh, I was flying by the seat of my pants through most of that campaign. So it'd be super fun to just have all that information just collected already and be able to refer to that. <laughs> I, I do so many projects by the seat of my pants, just improvising. But, uh, honestly, that's half the fun. Not to get too emotional but friendship is dragons what friendship is dragon means to me is boiled down to one word stability this has been a stabilizing force in my life and i've said this before in author's notes and whatnot but not only in just driving the support through patreon which has literally kept me alive and sane this project has carried me through some pretty rough times the fact that people are reading, the fact that people are participating, the, pa- the fact that people are basically volunteering content, adding more value to that comic, it's kept me going through what has felt like the times where I have just been drifting in the wind with no control. And this has meant so much to me. Despite everything, it's still here. You're still here. I'm still here. 
And there's something reaffirming about that. I don't cry easily, but I'm starting to feel a bit of tightness around the eyes. <sighs> Getting a little that shaky breath. I can never overstay and never thank enough for your support and readership. It's impossible because it has meant the world to me when my world has felt like constant earthquakes. Constant monthly earthquakes. Being able to do this, this simple thing, and just keep hacking away at it, keep building, keep creating, keep reading comments and stories and feedback. There is a value as a creator to that sort of serialization because what it provides is stability. And I can't thank you enough for that. I wrote a list of topics because I was going to do a vlog basically improvised. And the last item I wrote was the future of Friendship is Dragons because I figured we're at a thousand. We've reached a thousand pages. What's next? And I don't know. I had at one point an end in mind for the comic. Just sort of one last arc that I could end things on and just with an ending that looks towards the future, but I would be done with the project. But on the other hand, I'm not sure I'm ready yet to start that countdown. Because I don't know what comes after it. I feel like in terms of the Patreon, I, I that's what mainly drives the you know support and engagement. It's my main thing right now. And I don't know what I'm going to do after it. And I feel like I need something of that scale to... You know, there's going to be a lot of people wondering what the follow-up to that is. And I've seen a lot of people, you know, start their sophomore webcomic and burn out on it within months. And I feel like if I just try to, whatever I try to follow up from that energy, with that momentum, is going to kind of meet a similar fate. Because I'm not an artist, I'm a writer. I'm not a terribly fast writer, and I tend not to start projects until I have a certain amount of creative inspiration built up so I can hit the ground running. So I, I never know what the future holds for me in terms of projects. I would love to end, end the comic as I intended, but I don't know if I'm ready yet. I'm not sure if I'm stable enough yet, <laughs> to be honest. I might just continue on into Paragon tier for a bit, but I feel like I don't I don't know if I could I have the energy to finish that. I have an idea for how I could continue, but I also have an idea for how I could end. That's that's the summary. It really kind of depends on where my life goes from here. Cuz you got to take care of yourself first, right? Uh, how do you end one of these things? I guess just by saying thank you. Thank you to all of my patrons for supporting me on Patreon and literally keeping me alive. Thank you to everyone on the Discord server for chatting and, you know, some of you being very close friends. And for being wonderful collaborators in, you know, tabletop projects. Thank you to everyone who's read the comic. You know, whether, whether you keep up with it every single day or whether you leave it alone for a few months and then come back to it and binge it again. Both ways of reading are totally valid. I mean, that's how I read webcomics. I don't, <laughs> I don't follow anything day by day. I'm not up to date on anything. Thanks to friends and family who've supported this project just emotionally. <sighs> Thank you. It's a silly thing 
that we've made. It's a screen cap webcomic about ponies and D&D. But we also built, you know, just a little community there, a little corner of the internet. For how small a thing it is, I don't think it can be taken for granted. And I just wanted to tear down the walls and say that personally. Thanks for reading and thanks for listening.